Sir Arthur Lewis. He made it seem like it was every day. Every day, you become the first to win a prize like that. Arthur remains the only white person ever to have won a Nobel Prize in the science subjects other than literature and peace. He was the first black student at the London School of Economics, the first black teacher at the London School of Economics. He was the first black faculty member at the University of Manchester, the first black full professor at Princeton University. I saw him as a rebel. He was born on a small island, not too many resources, but clearly smart as a whip. And he goes on to be knighted to become the first black professor at Princeton, advisor to African and Caribbean governments. It's got to be rebel in it. To come out of the Caribbean, be educated, have thinking in those years about development economics is more pioneering than we can ever think. Arthur was born on the very small island of St. Lucia. Dad was born January 23rd of 1915 in St. Lucia in the West Indies, which at that time was a British colony. He got sick when he was really young. So he could not attend school right away. And so his father gave him lots of lessons on the stuff that he would be learning in first and second grade and did such a good job that Arthur was promoted two classes above the class that he should have been in. The small island of St. Lucia had one very good high school, St. Mary's College, where he was given a most proper English education. So he ended up leaving school at age 16 and had to wait to go into college because those days early admission for being younger than normal didn't happen. And at that point, he was helping his mom. They owned a store. So he was helping doing business administration. He then took the scholarship that was one scholarship for all the islands and won it. And so he ended up at the University of London for his undergraduate career. Arthur decided that he would go to the London School of Economics and study commerce. So here is this young man. <laughs> He's the first black student at the London School of Economics. His first advisor said, this is the smartest guy I've seen. His mentors at the London School of Economics said, we think you could study for a PhD. And so he decided that he would do that. So he teaches at LSE. The fact that this is the first black man who was ever going to teach at the London School of Economics is a big deal. But he was given a one-year career, and he was not permitted to advise students individually. There was the fear, proved to be absolutely wrong, that students might not want to be advised by a black man. But they loved him, so they overwhelmingly asked to be advised by him. He was so easy to approach. He was my idea of the ultimate professorial professor, and if anything, a little bit of an absent-minded professor. <laughs> but when you spoke with him, you realize he's anything but. He made just a strong impression on me. He was always enamored of education. He thought that education was the way in which individuals and societies could realize their ambitions. One of the reasons we went to public school was because it was important to encourage the public schools to be good so that the kids who went through the public school system were as good as the ones who went through the private schools. How do you continue to have the high expectations for all students no matter where they come from? A number of students are coming from the third world. And so they said to Arthur, we don't want to study just about economics of developed countries. We want to study about the economics of less developed countries. And so he introduced, for the first time, a course called Colonial Economics. 
It was the beginning of his work in that particular field. He was very interested in a broad range of things to do with economic growth, but I think the thing he's most famous for is the sort of story of why economic growth didn't automatically stop people being poor. Economic development with unlimited supplies of labor. That is his most famous article. It's about 56, 55, and he has this insight that the current economic models aren't working because they're assuming a limited supply of labor. And when you look at the developing countries, you've got an unlimited supply of labor. So the price of labor is constantly being suppressed by young people coming in from the countryside, keeping the wages low. And that becomes the basis for the economic work that he did and the, the forming of the development economics branch. It was his experience in some of these third world countries that had a profound influence on him. And the West Indies, surely. He was a West Indian. He understood the dilemmas that were facing the West Indies. Lewis was very much in favor of the union of all of the West Indian islands that were part of the British Empire. When it seemed to be coming apart, he said that he would try to persuade the various nationalist politicians that what they should do is try to create this United West Indian Federation. He exhausted himself, had some fainting spells, and the physician came and looked at him and said, you can't do this anymore. It's gonna kill you. He decided that he had to look around for another position, and that other position was Princeton University. There are four fields in the Woodrow Wilson School. They tried to bring in distinguished professors in each of those four areas. So he would have been, in that sense, the founding professor of the development field at Princeton. His insights were profound, and they very much influenced our master's students in the Woodrow Wilson School, where it's a professional school. So he was able to also infuse for them not only the theoretical underpinnings of his thinking, but also the fact that he had been doing himself and how they can use those models in order to make change in the real world. I just wanted someone to give me a template as to how countries develop so I could go do what I'm doing. And I've had that template for my whole career. Economic studies the real world, and the more of the real world you get in there, the better. His background was much more like the students we have in the Winter Wilson School than the professors we have in the economics department. He started here in Princeton in 63. He was the first and only black full professor at that point. There was an assistant professor, but he was the first full professor. The whole civil rights movement is happening. Princeton is debating whether or not to have women, and all of those kinds of issues are happening in the, in the 60s. So they asked Dad if he had any opinion as to teaching women, and he says, no. <laughs> he doesn't have a problem. Why should he have a problem? When I came to Princeton in 75, there was not a lot of color here. For students like myself, it did make a difference to see a person of color here. Institutions of higher education need to reflect our society. And in light of the discussions that were happening on campus here at Princeton two years ago or so, where there was a, a real effort by the students to say, you've done a great job at admitting a more diverse student body. But you know what, we look around and we don't see our faces in the iconography, and we don't see our names in the naming of buildings and other important places on campus. At the Woodrow Wilson School, there's really no more important place than the Sir Arthur Lewis Auditorium. We hold classes there, we hold our public events there. It's a very important space within Robertson Hall. And so it was a very important gesture for us to rename it after somebody who was so foundational and so important and such a pathbreaker as was Sir Arthur Lewis. There is a lot of attachment to the building. That is the place that resonates with me when I think of him because that's where his office was. He has a strong history with that building. Sir Arthur Lewis is most deserving to have 
that auditorium named after him. I think he'd be flattered, and part of him would be wondering, isn't there anybody better? <laughs> I don't know that he ever grew out of the I was just doing my job attitude. He contributed greatly to the wider world, which is what Princeton is about. Sir Arthur Lewis really exemplifies the best of Princeton and the Woodrow Wilson School. He was not only a top academic as reflected in his Nobel Prize in economics, but he was also a practitioner who believed in the power of the economic discipline for making policy change and for making economic development come alive in many contexts. And that is really what the power of the Woodrow Wilson School is here at Princeton. I personally think that his life is one of the most extraordinary lives of achievements.